All right, so let's get started here. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Thomas Emerson. I'm from Silinx. I'm going to talk about system device trees today, together with Stefano Stabellini and Rose Ashfield. So we have lots of materials. So we'll go through this pretty quickly here. Uh, obviously, the slides are uploaded, and there's some contact information at the end if you want to engage in, in this. The way we have set up this is uh, in a form of frequently asked questions. So instead of going through all the various slides, and we've been doing that in various contexts before, we thought that instead we will mix it up a little bit and, and answer some questions around device trees. And the first ones are more general and will serve as an introduction to system device trees as well here. All right, great. So first question here, what is a system device tree? So if you jump to the next one there. Uh, so system device tree really trying to, to solve the problem of how do we get hardware information to the software stacks? So in particular, operating systems, firmware, hypervisors, those kind of things that need to know about where is the memory, what memory is allocated to me? Where are all the devices? Where are they mapped in memory? The interrupt, so on and so forth, right? And in particular, these new systems that are out there now are very heterogeneous. So you have multiple processors and they have multiple execution environments. So you might have a, a Linux running at the same time as an RTOS, at the same time as a hypervisor and so on and so forth. And so we need to come up with a way on how do we get all this kind of information to these different software stacks. Uh, and this is really tricky to do in, in general. And in the past, it's been done in an ad hoc way. So what we really need here is a standard way of, of doing it. So if you go to the next slide. And since there already is an ex a standard that really serves us well, which is device trees used by Linux, U-Boot, Zen, Hypervisor, and, and, and other things. What we wanted to do was to extend that to be able to handle multiple different environments at the same time. Right? So we're extending the device trees backwards to compatible so that you can have multiple CPU clusters and you can define how you want to share things. And we really have two different parts here. One is adding to the traditional device tree specifications. So you can add new CPU clusters and their views of the address in space and so on. Uh, and then we're also adding a section so that you can define the allocation of, of resources. So let's say that you want to have one gig of memory going to the, your Linux and another gig going to your, your RTOS, or you want to have the NIC assigned to the RTOS, but the UART design assigned to, to the Linux. So there's a way then to specify those things. So those are the two sections. And we're trying to separate that a little bit. So one is more of a describing the hardware, and the other one is more about how do you configure it? How do you allocate the resources? All right, go to the next one. As part of this, we are going to talk about something we call execution domain. So it's going to talk a little bit about that here. So if you go to the next one. So an execution domain, uh, pretty simple concept. In, in general, it's you can view it as an address space that's unique and different from, from other things. So for example, a Linux kernel has a, a, an address space. So that would be one execution domain. If you have a hypervisor like Zen, well, it's running on the same CPU, but it actually has a different view of the memory and the devices. So that would be a different execution domain. So an execution domain could be running on a, a separate core, for example, if you have a Cortex-M or Cortex-R versus a Cortex-A core or multiple clusters. Uh, it could be on the same core, but that you have different execution levels. So the user space versus operating system and hypervisor and the trusted firmware and so on. And you also have a way of dividing your address space using trust zone. So a trusted execution environment would be, for example, a different domain 
than, than uh, your Linux as an example. So the domain is really the edge space, the view of the memory and an operating environment is really the operating system or firmware or hypervisor that's running within that context. Okay, moving to the next. And I think Stefano, you take over here. All right. Um, so what's the difference between system device tree and device tree? So um, concretely, uh, system device tree needs to be able to describe more, to describe a full platform uh, with heterogeneous CPU clusters. For instance, a platform with a Cortex-A cluster and a Cortex-R cluster. Um, and also to describe execution domains in the way that, that Thomas just uh, introduced them. Um, so for the first set uh, of uh, description, so the hardware uh, description, actually we can do everything with these three new concepts. So these are three new additions to the device tree spec that allow us to, to um, describe these heterogeneous systems. So one is CPU cluster. Uh, of course, you need a way to, to, to explain, to, to describe that there is more than one CPU cluster, and that is what this attribute CPU cluster is for. Then uh, it might be that certain resources, a bus, a device, uh, is only accessible, is only uh, wired to one of the C two CPU clusters or one of the many CPU clusters. And that's why we have indirect, indirect bus, which is a new type of bus that does not automatically map to the parent address space. That means that it's not automatically visible. Um, and address map is to uh, explicitly map these resources like indirect buses so that you can explicitly say that this resource is actually visible from this domain and not from the other. So I'm gonna show you a concrete example. So here we have still uh, your, you know, the usual CPU cluster, the, the default cluster could be the Cortex-A cluster where Linux run, for instance. And then we have uh, another cluster here, a Cortex-R5 cluster, uh, which is compatible CPUs cluster. Um, and, and finally, we have an, um, a bus, an indirect bus. So the idea is that this bus is only visible by the R5 cluster. So to do that, uh, we specify that this indirect bus is compatible to indirect bus, of course. And also we explicitly mapped it into the Cortex R cluster address space using the address mass property. Because it was not mapped, there is no address map property in the default cluster. There could be, but it's not used. Uh, then uh, the bus is not visible to the to the default cluster. So, speaking of default cluster, so one question we might have: Why still have it? I mean, if we go back, you, you can see. I mean, clearly, we could have described the system using two CPU clusters in the new way, right? The new this new compatible string. Um, well. One reason is that it's actually convenient to have uh, one uh, default that, that owns everything, but everything is assigned by default. It's also very common in many configurations when there is a Linux system that has uh, all resources except for a few. Um, but also, this is a more subtle, but maybe more important. It really turns system device tree into a natural addition on top of device tree. Uh, it makes it much easier and simpler to introduce these new concepts like the one I just discussed uh, on top of the regular device tree specification and add them themselves to the specification. Finally, it gives us a chance to maintain backward compatibility with existing systems. So uh, with the default uh, CPU cluster, it is conceivable to produce a system device tree that describes more than one cluster, but still where Linux is able to boot. All right, so there, is a, there are a number of questions that we usually get uh, on system device tree. And one, on one of the top one is, how do we describe interrupts? So, you know, you just showed these three new concepts. There is nothing about interrupt there. So let's start by uh, explaining how do we describe interrupt controllers. So in, in an heterogeneous system, typically like the one we are using as an example with a Cortex-R cluster and a Cortex-A cluster, each cluster is going to have its own private interrupt controller. And to be able to describe that, we need to be able to show that one interrupt controller is only visible by one of the two clusters, and the, only, the other interrupt controller is only visible by the other cluster. And we do that using the same address map and the indirect bus trick that we used before. So in this example, uh, the uh, Cortex-R interrupt controller is under an indirect bus, which is only mapped by the Cortex-R cluster. 
vice versa. The Cortex-A cluster interrupt controller is under a normal simple bus. That means it's going to automatically translate to the parent address space, so the default cluster will see it. The Cortex-R the Cortex cluster will not see it because it's not explicitly mapped using the address map property. So this is a technique that is generally applicable, and you can use it to um, describe any kind of resources that are only visible by one of the cluster, not visible by the other cluster, or, or by a subset of clusters, to, to, to really uh, describe how the whole board has been wired. Uh, what about interrupts themselves? This was about interrupt controllers. So typically what we want to show is a resource as interrupt to go, that are wired to go to both interrupt controllers. And then, you know, uh, depending on configuration, only one of the two clusters might still receive the interrupt, but thermal wiring, it goes to both. And we can do that using the existing standard properties in the interrupt map, in the interrupt map mask and interrupt map pass through. This is the way they're described in the device tree specification today. So this is not new. And this is saying that basically uh, this CAN bus interrupt, which I picked just as an example, uh, it goes to uh, both as two parents interrupt controllers. So it goes to both the interrupt controller of the A cluster and to the interrupt controller of the R cluster. All right, so this tells us how to describe uh, um, most hardware configurations. Um, and, but what about how we configure the system, uh, the software, the firmware, uh, to assign resources, to dedicate resources to CPU clusters. So this is not about wiring, this is about the execution domain configuration. Um, so let's look in details about, um, about execution domains. So the idea each domain has uh, is specified where, you know, which CPUs uh, is, um, is related to, so where the software is running specifically, uh, what memory region are dedicated to them, and what devices are dedicated. The way it's described is using this format. So there is a CPU attribute that um, tell us which are the CPUs where the software is running on. In this case, a Cortex-R cluster. There can be special flags to explain uh, also to describe the execution mode, uh, lockstep, not lockstep, uh, and also the execution level. Um, then a memory attribute that tell us which memory region have been dedicated to the execution domain that it can be more than one uh, range, like in this example. The second range is just one page. In, it is meant to show that you can use this simple technique also to describe shared memory regions between a multiple execution domains. Uh, that way uh, you can set up a, a page with a ring buffer for communication. And finally, maybe most important is the access list. The access list is a list of links to resources that can be uh, accessed by these um, by this execution domain, possibly only uniquely accessible by this ex execution domain. So before I dig more into what that means, um, I would like to point out that we, uh, in this example, uh, there is a new top level node called domains. The purpose of that is to collect all these execution domain configurations. So given that these are software and firmware configuration, it's good to keep them separate. And originally, they were, uh, we were proposing you know, adding them under the chosen node. However, for, for reasons that will become apparent soon, uh, also it's still feasible, it's, it's cleaner and, bet and better to have them separate. All right, so how do we configure bus firewall? So often, in order to dedicate, if you really want to dedicate and protect a device, uh, you will really need to configure the bus firewall to do it. So the idea is, that out of the information on the system device tree uh, in the execution domain configuration, it is possible to generate the bus firewall configuration. So this is the information the bus firewall need, just not in the format that the bus firewall needed. So the idea is that to, you know, we could write um, a plugin for Lopper, the tool that Bruce will introduce soon to uh, parse system device trees to generate out of this information, the appropriate bus firewall configuration. If you can see here, there are memory ranges. You can find all the information from the link about the MMIO region of the, of the device. So all the information is there. So there is one thing that's missing that we have been thinking about, and I'm, I'm telling about this more like a problem statement. Uh, we don't really have a 
uh, defined solution yet, but often bus firewalls don't have that many slots. So it, it is common to have a configuration where there are more devices to protect, more domains than the amount of slots the bus firewall has to protect them. So in these, in these scenarios, we have to make the difficult choice of protecting only some, only the most important devices and the most important domains. And that's why I think uh, we need to introduce something like priorities, like a priority per domain to say this domain uh, has a higher priority than this other domain. It should definitely be protected first, uh, like maybe a safety critical domain. But we might even have, uh, we might even need higher granularity such as uh, per memory range or per device priority to be able to say this device actually has a much higher uh, priority than the other device. Um, yeah, we'll discuss we we'll discuss priorities uh, in one in one of the next open up calls. All right, um, I have only one last point here. Uh, that's about chosen and reserved memory. So, chosen and reserved memory are firmware and and software configurations. They exist today. They're top level nodes. For instance, chosen um, has information about uh, the common line arguments for Linux. So in system device tree, they still exist and they still have the same meaning that they have uh, today, meaning that they are software configuration of the software running on the default CPU cluster. Uh, so the um, Linux running on uh, the Cortex-A cluster, if that's the default cluster, it will still get the argument under chosen. However, other um, other execution domain still need their own pot potentially, they need their own common line argument for the operating system running there, or they need special memory reservation for special drivers like reserve memory, like reserve memory does. So we need another, another chosen and reserve memory node under each domain to express these configurations. So the idea is uh, that each domain will come with all the configuration needed for the software running on top. And that's the end of my part. And I'll, I'll let uh, Bruce continue. Yeah, um, hopefully everybody can hear me. I've been having some network bandwidth issues this, the issues this morning, so I'm not going to turn my video on um, for safety reasons that I might disappear. Um, so I'm going to do a very quick overview of uh, what is uh, what is Lopper. Um, if we can jump to the next slide, Stefano. Um, so it's something that we've been poking away at and I've been working on since um, probably May of last year. Um, and it, it, it's a tool for manipulating the system device trees because uh, they, they can be quite large and, and, and we're trying to eliminate some of the errors in, in manual editing and, and, and supporting these different workflows of different people working on a system device tree as it goes through a system. Um, and, but the, the primary goal that we had, you know, when it started and it, as it still exists is that it's to produce a standard device tree to support existing uh, platforms and operating systems. So, you know, it, it inevitably you can take a system device tree and the default that comes out of Lopper is a device tree that Linux or um, what anything that's used to parsing or, or manipulating a standard device tree, it won't have any any elements that it doesn't understand. So you don't have to modify every operating system immediately to work with a, a system device tree. Um, it is data driven. It doesn't fundamentally understand system device tree. Um, I have a slide that shows a few of the inputs uh, very quickly. Um, so there, it. There's no hard-coded logic in the tree. It works on, a, on, on various inputs um, and it uses plugins and um, operations to do, to do anything from generate code, do custom outputs or, or do device trees. Um, it is going to be, it's open source. It's under a BSD3 license. I have the link to where it will be probably by the end of the day. Um, that's a landing page, which will be updated to uh, the, the code where it will sit on GitHub or, or whatever we put it under. Um, it is literally just Python and libftt and the Python uh, bindings. It works with um, DTC um, to compile device trees, but then after that, it works completely on uh, DTBs at the moment. And we're exploring different ways to manipulate um, the back end, but right now that's, you know, that's sort of, it's using as little as possible to be as simple as possible and portable as possible. Um, and um, 
it also, uh, you, there's modes where we can output uh, device trees and it performs extra validation and consistency checking during output. So if you end up doing something that drops one of your um, P handles that uh, Stefano was showing in the access node, it knows how to either notify you or, or make corrections through the tree on the way out. All right. So yeah, we can jump right these. This, I just had a slide here um, that shows what are the different parts that go into Lopper. And, and you know, fundamentally on the left, it is only we didn't create anything. They're all standards-based inputs. So whether they're system device tree or or normal device tree, DTS files or overlays and these. Uh, LOPs, which are LOPER operations. And they're also actually in specified right now in a device tree type format. Um, and then you see in the middle what LOPER is. It's just, it's Python, DTC, CPP, everything that you'd expect um, with a, a bunch of different sort of backends where you can say, go back to DTS if you want to manipulate the source more. Um, you can do DTB to C if you want to generate C device drivers for an IRTOS or bare metal or it can do a custom you know, firewall, bus firewall specification that Stefano was um, talking about. So the point is that it's using open source inputs, it manipulates the device tree, and then it has various backends to do um, whatever output you may need. So I just did a quick capture of, you know, the question is how do I run Lopper? As I mentioned, that's the primary goal is to create a traditional device tree. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it pretty much, it takes a system device tree. Uh, it takes a domain node as inputs and then a bunch of LOPER operations, whether they're custom or built in. It outputs a standard device tree. Um, so what it does in the flow is always, it applies operations to the tree as specified in the operations file. It finds a domain node. It can call an assist or do basic operations on those domain nodes, which will manipulate the tree. And then it, outputs the modified system device tree. You can either do it as a, this sort of raw um, DTB dump, or you can validate um, the tree on the way out and go back to source. But either way, the output is a standard device tree. Oh, and this, yeah, it's a bit small, but it's more here for reference. This is just an example run where we're taking this uh, uh, R5 domain that you know, Stefano was using as an example, a system device tree for a Versal, and it's outputting a Linux R5 DTS. And you can see the run, and there's some things here where it knows how to, it had an, two different CPU clusters, it deletes one, it renames some nodes, um, it does, and then the bottom part here, it's writing this, this output DTS, which I can see I left foo.dts uh, in there, uh, it, and it does validation, and you can see that it's doing some p-handle replacement and, and, and validation of the tree on the way out. And just in this example, I just grabbed a couple things that the system device tree on the way in, it had 84 elements, if you will, um, just you know, so a, a, a block in the device tree that was uh, had a label. And after we've run it, we're now, you know, we're down to 41. So it dropped half of the system device tree. And for example, before we started, the CPU's node was the Cortex A72. Um, and after we run it, which is the right-hand side, it's now, been renamed as the default CPUs are now the R5s. So it, it knew as part of this manipulation to drop the, the, the A72s, it kept the R5s and it renamed them to CPUs um, as the default boot, say for Linux or whatever, would only be looking under CPUs. And the question is, what about an RTOS or something without device tree support, what can you do? Um, and so again, same inputs, always a system device tree. You don't need a domain node in this case, potentially, uh, law for operations. And what in this case, it does, applies the operations, processes the tree. And in this case, there is a, it will always put out the device tree that was a reference, however it was changed. But it, it has an OS specific module that um, uh, outputs, in this case, some C defines and some code uh, based on the modified device tree. And I just did a little snippet of an example that I ran one where I was pretend I was doing a safety critical device tree and we took the versal and we wanted to output the RTOS header.h. And so in this case, it knew how to modify the device tree and made a bunch of defines with constants that were left as a, as a sample. And it also was putting out and implementing some structures based on what was left in the, in the field. So 
that's completely flexible. That's just a Python assist that I wrote to show how easy it is to modify a device tree and then uh, print out uh, C code as an example. All right, I think we're out of time. On the uh, slide deck that's uploaded, we have an extra slide that talks about how you can engage with system device trees. So this is a project under the Linaro device tree evolution project that's going on in Linaro. And uh, it's under the open amp umbrella we're driving the system device tree. And there's a couple of links there so you can uh, get in touch with us and there's a mailing list as well. I guess we have one question. There is an address map property new for system device tree. So Stefano, maybe you can take that. Um, yeah, uh, the address map property is new and was uh, one of those introduced specifically for system device tree. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 and it's meant to uh, map, uh, especially in direct buses, that otherwise has not, have, have no way of being mapped into the address space of a CPU cluster. Uh, 